back to the reg regular scheduled programming. You're thinking about the hats that you have on. The hats that I bring to this are first as a researcher. So I am the co-director of the Digital Youth Lab at the University of Washington Information School. Um, and I'm also a parent of Oliver who turned six in December and he's in kindergarten now. Um, and so as a researcher, I can't believe it, but it's been about 18 years that I've been doing this work. And um, the way, this is basically what I do in a nutshell. I, I study what kids are doing with technologies. Um, a lot of my work has focused on teens and social media, um, but I also look at younger kids and their parents and caregivers. I really try and understand what they're doing with different technologies and then design positive technology experiences for and with them. And I work very closely with Jason Yip, who I think many of you know, and who is an alum of Maryland. And I've worked with his Kids Team group a lot. Um, and I know Kids Team um, uh, started here, right in Maryland. And I've seen a couple of pictures of Alice and Druin around, which is kind of cool. Her, she's not here, but she's kind of here still. Um, so as a researcher, um, I, and perhaps you are, very, very comfortable with these kinds of phrases when I'm, especially when it comes to kids and technology. Um, I really am very comfortable with this idea of it is very complicated. Um, you know, um, I love digging into the nuance of what kids are doing with technology and when is it good, when is it not so good. Um, and for most of my career, I've typically given one or more of these answers when people not in my field, friends, family, or even other researchers who aren't studying kids and technology ask me, so what's the verdict? Is it good or bad? And I've most of the time given one of these answers. And then six years ago, I became a, pa a parent and I realized that those answers really are not very helpful for guiding concrete decisions. Um, like how many episodes of Paw Patrol are too many? When should I introduce Oliver to video games? Um, I've really just, he's played a few video games, not too much. He really, really wants um, me to download Pokemon Go on my phone and I'm holding off a bit. Um, when should I give him a phone? All of these questions are um, really, they're very concrete. And as a researcher, I started to think, is there anything useful that I've been doing for the last 18 years um, that could help me make some of these decisions? Um, and so that's really, it was this tension between those two roles, um, my researcher hat and my parent hat that really motivated me to write Technologies Child. And I wanted to explore if there is anything concrete to be distilled from this complexity of the research. Oh, what was that? I just heard. Oh, okay. No problem. Um, and so I wanted to see if there's anything concrete that could be distilled for me as a parent, but also other stakeholders like par um, teachers and policymakers, technology designers. And so really this book is my attempt to bring um, my two roles as a parent and a teacher together. Um, and then also in the process, I bring in some other roles that I take on sometimes. So in my past life, I started off my career as an elementary school teacher. So when I'm exploring learning, um, I'm putting on that hat. And then also as a big sister, which I'll talk about in a little bit later in the talk. And so as a developmental scientist, I wanted to look at the full arc of child development, um, starting from early childhood and going into emerging adulthood. And for each of these stages of development, I wanted to zoom in our, on one or two areas that were particularly important. So, and particularly salient during that time. So for early childhood, I was looking at the development of executive function and early literacy, two constellations of skills that are just super important um, to set kids off on a good path during the rest of their development. Moving into middle childhood, I was looking at play and learning. Then as kids get older, looking at changing family relationships, friendships, identity development, and then into emerging adulthood, I was looking at civic engagement. So there's a chapter more or less on each one of these topics. And for each one of the areas, I, as a developmental scientist, I wanted to pull out 
what does theory and research tell us about what kids need to thrive at each stage and in each of these areas of development? So with that developmental context, I then widened my search um, and looked at, okay, well, what's the research on technology in each of these areas? And um, so I was focused on my research and what I've learned over um, the last several years, but also I cast a very wide net. And, you know, you're in an iSchool, I'm in iSchool, we're very used to looking across disciplines and pulling out the best research that informs the questions that we have. And so that's what I was doing, um, as well as looking at my research, which has mostly focused on identity development, peer and family relationships, learning and well being. Um, so needless to say, it was a lot of research that I wrangled for this book. Um, I looked and there are 672 footnotes and over a thousand citations. Um, so that it's sprawling. And whenever people would ask me, what are you working on? And I would tell them, they're like, that's a lot, you know, the whole arc of child development. And so it was a lot. And for a long time, I was despairing, like, is there anything like concrete I can pull from this? Um, but there, what kept me focused throughout this time was the central question. When does technology support child development and when does it not? Um, and so I found that although the research is complex, there are a lot of it depends kind of answers. But even so, I was able to detect a signal in all of this research, which I developed into a two-step um, decision framework. Um, and it can be really, this framework can be distilled into a single sentence here. So self-directed, community-supported digital experiences are best for children's healthy development. And so in my talk, I'm going to dig into each of these components, self-direction and community support. Um, and I'll, as I do so, I'll bring in some examples from the book. So I'm going to start with self-directed tech experiences. And so basically, these are experiences that place children in the driver's seat of their digital experiences, um, their digital interaction. So they're really in control. The agency is with them. And the example that I'm going to use is children's digital play. And so in the book, um, I start every chapter by thinking, what and laying the context of what's going on developmentally when we talk about play you know what's the developmental purpose of children's play so these are just some of the key skills that kids are learning little kids and also not so little kids are learning as they are engaged in play so they're learning to think symbolically they're learning counterfactual reasoning and like they're little scientists basically they're trying things out they're seeing what happens they're adjusting they're learning theory of mind that other people don't necessarily have the same perspective, the same desires as they do. Um, in the process of learning that, they're learning interpersonal skills and how to negotiate issues of fairness. So in that sense, they're developing their moral sensibility. Um, when things don't go their way, they're learning to regulate their own emotions. So there's a lot going on in play and it's really important for child development. But not all play is created equal and not all play experiences are going to develop these kinds of skills. So the question is what kinds of play experiences are best for children's development? Um, now, first of all, there are lots of different kinds of play. There's rough and tumble play, there's fantasy play, there's all sorts of kinds of play and each of them has a role in development. But generally speaking, open-ended self-directed play is arguably one of the most important forms of play um, because it's that kind of open-ended flexible experiences like playing with old boxes. So this is my son, Oliver, um, actually in the height of the pandemic when we had a lot of boxes in our apartment in Berlin playing with his stepsister, Philippa. Um, and when kids are in this sort of um, playing with these materials, like old boxes, they're developing their own plot lines, their own actions. Again, they're testing things out, adjusting accordingly. accordingly. Um, if they're playing with other people, like here they're more in parallel play, but when they come together, they're trying to negotiate what's fair and what's not. Um, and so 
one thing way to think about this kind of play where they're in the driver's seat rather than being led by the design of a of a game or something like that or, or of a toy that has a very specific function one way to think about that is through the affordances that play experiences offer like this. And so I talk in the book about this concept of loose parts play, which um, was developed by Simon Nicholson, who is a late sculpture um, professor. But I first came across this idea when I read um, Alexandra Lang's excellent book, which some of you may have um, come across, The Design of Childhood. And I highly recommend that's a great book. Um, but basically, um, this idea with loose parts, children are really the ones who are using boxes or sand or water or pebbles or I don't know, like paper clips even. And through that, they're creating their own worlds rather than playing within the world of someone else's design. And it's that kind of open-ended, self-directed play that's critical to development. But the question is, do loose parts exist in digital form? Do they come in digital form? And so to answer this question, let's take a look at two different digital experiences. Um, so Peppa's Paint Box and Paw Patrol Rescue Run. And so both of these apps are currently on Oliver's tablet. And over the last few years, especially when he was three or four, he's really enjoyed both of these. But as I'm going to show, the kind of play experiences that each of these apps offer are actually quite different. So here we have Oliver playing Peppa's paint box. Well, he's choosing that he's going to open it and immediately he's taken to a blank canvas. So immediately there's no suggestion of what he should do. He can choose his implement. Um, here he decides that he wants to start with a big can of paint and blue's his favorite color. So he decides that he wants to cover his blank canvas in blue. Um, and then after he's finished doing that, he can choose a paintbrush. Here he he likes the multicolored one, and he can just draw freely until as long as he wants. You know, there's there's no constraints here. Um, they also have these cute little um, stamps that are tied to elements of the show, and they're animated. So he really likes these flower ones, and he adds more and more. And I've sped up the video a bit, and he covers his, his canvas. And all of the all of the animals are ooing and aahing. And now this is clearly not going to make it to the walls of the Louvre, but he's had fun. And importantly, he has been in charge of this experience. He's directed it. He's decided what he wants to do for how long. Um, while he does this, we typically have conversations because his attention isn't completely absorbed um, by what he's doing. I'm not going to show a video of Paw Patrol, but just highlight some of the distinguishing characteristics of that game, especially in comparison to Peppa's Paint Box. So Paw Patrol Rescue Run is more of a typical video game. And so there's a set course there. You can choose different missions um, that take place in Venture Bay, which if you're familiar with Paw Patrol, that's where all the action happens. Um, and so you choose your mission and the whole idea is to complete this course um, in a set amount of time in as, in as efficient a way as you possibly can. There's a clear forward direction. In fact, that's the only direction you can go. Um, and along the way, as you're doing this as efficiently as you can, you're supposed to collect as many pup treats as you can, earn a lot of badges, and that is highly motivating for Oliver. That keeps him playing um, a lot longer than he ordinarily would because he just wants more pup treats and he wants more badges and he wants to collect all of the badges. Um, and so when you look at these two apps side by side and you ask the question, who's in control, the child or the app? I would argue with Peppa's paint box, Oliver's pretty much the one in control. With Paw Patrol Rescue Run, he's definitely not the one in control. And I notice that when he's playing this, it's very hard for me to have a conversation with him because his attention is so directed um, on this app. 
So there are certain elements of Peppa's paint box that make it self-directed, and this is part of my framework. Um, so it's very open-ended. You open it, there's a blank canvas. It's self-paced, it's not system-paced. Um, there are loose parts in the form of being able to, well, first of all, the blank canvas, you could say, is a loose part that it can be filled any way that he, that he wants to fill it. Um, there, you can choose your implement, your um, drawing implement. It could be a paint can, it could be your finger, it could be anything. You could choose your color. And notably, there's an absence of dark patterns here. So I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with this concept of dark patterns, um, specific design features that his sole purpose is to just keep you playing, keep you on a platform, keep you engaged in a particular digital activity. So in the case of children's technology, some of the common dark patterns that you will see are things like time pressures, game characters who cry when you exit out of a game, um, virtual rewards like pup treats, and things like navigation constraints just making it difficult to find your way home so you keep playing. Um, and so this question, who's in control, the child or the technology, that can be applied to games for young kids, but it really can be applied, I would argue, to any sort of digital experience across the spectrum of child development. And hopefully by really looking at these two examples, and I don't think I have to do too much convincing here with this crowd, design is really important. The way these two apps have been designed really shapes the kind of experience and the kind of play that Oliver is engaged in. Um, so I would say that overall, something like Peppa's Paint Box is much more of a self-directed experience. Um, I want to add one little coda though, and this is something that I talk about in the book, is digital versus analog loose parts. So one thing about painting on Peppa's, in Peppa's paint box is that, yes, it's very open-ended, it's user-paced, and that's great, but there is a limit. You know, there, there are limits to the colors that Oliver can choose. So when he's painting in um, the analog world, they can mix, he and Philippa are mixing colors to their heart's content. They can make really fine gradations of colors. Um, on Peppa's paint box, there's like, maybe five or six different colors. Now in different drawing apps, there could be many more, many more gradations, but there's always going to be a limit and there's always, it's always gonna be determined by the designer of that particular app. So just to say that, yes, there are loose parts to be found in digital form, um, but they might not be quite so loose when they have been transposed into zeros and ones versus when they're in um, an analog form. Okay, so I want to move now, um, now that we have a sense of what a self-directed digital experience is, I want to take a look at what that might look like for slightly older kids when we get into the teen years um, and adolescence in particular and social media in particular. Um, and so here I'm going to dig a little bit deeper, not just into how much design matters, but I'm also going to talk about individual children and the characteristics that they bring to their digital experiences, as well as the different um, sociocultural context that they bring, because it's not just the design, of course, that matters, but it's also everything surrounding it. Um, so just as I did with early childhood and play, um, looking at adolescence, I think, okay, so what are the key developmental jobs of a teen, a tween and a teen? Um, so there are changing family relationships. There are the increasing centrality of peers. And as it tends to be that for many teens, they're starting to pull away from um, their parents and their family members. Uh, not completely, because uh, the process of indiv individuation requires or it, it involves maintaining that connection. And so parents and other caregivers are still important, um, but really the site of identity development, um, it kind of shifts a little bit to peer interactions. And then the whole job of developing an identity um, is really 
front and center during adolescence. And then as we move into later adolescence, emerging adulthood, um, what kinds of roles are you going to take on? That's sort of the idea of what might my career be? What are my civic roles that I'm going to assume? And how am I going to engage with um, society and the civic questions of our day? Um, so within this developmental context, of course, digital experiences play a role in each of these areas, um, from fa changing family relationships, figuring out when to give a child a phone, the site of most um, peer interactions, or at least there's some sort of digital component these days, identity development, and you get the idea. So digital experiences are definitely um, central here. Um, so what makes these digital experiences more or less self-directed? So it may not be the case that loose parts, the idea of loose parts translates perfectly well from a digital play experience to social media, but the idea of agency certainly does. So this idea that who is in the driver's seat, um, the teen or the technology, the young child or the game, these, this is, it's the same sort of questions. It's the same sort of thing with self-direction. Okay, so I want to start with the good stuff. When are teens in control? When are they experiencing self-directed digital experiences? And in my research, I tend to start with the positive, and I found lots of evidence of teens engaged in self-directed experiences when they're online. So whether that's developing their interests or skills, learning to cook, you know, um, learning music, um, writing fan fiction. My previous book was all about all of the skills that youth are um, learning when they are engaged in fan fiction communities, um, whether they're exploring emerging identities and particularly identities that may not um, be accepted in offline contexts and finding connection and community. So many teens are having these kinds of experiences every day, including my younger sibling, Molly, who I talk about in chapter seven of the book. Um, Molly was also a front and center in my um, first book, The App Generation. Um, now I wanna start my off this little conversation about Molly by prefacing that Molly is my much, much younger sibling. So um, I was a senior in high school when Molly was born. So Molly is a Gen Zer, like the older end of Gen Z. Um, and I'm definitely Gen X, the younger end of Gen X, but still. So we, um, there's, there's a big gap between us. Um, and so like all teens, Molly's story is distinct. It's distinct to her. Um, but there are certain themes in their story that resonate. Um, and so I want to, I first started off in this chapter talking about um, Molly first coming out to me as liking girls more than boys when they were in their, I believe, senior year of high school. And then while I was writing Technology's Child, um, Molly shared with me that they were now using they, them pronouns. And I just realized that a few sentences ago, I misgendered Molly um, and I apologize to Molly. Um, and also Molly is now exploring a trans identity. Um, and so for Molly, we had, I interviewed them a number of times for my book. And we had some amazing conversations and they told me just how central the internet was through this whole process of adolescence and emerging adulthood, first figuring out their sexual identity and then figuring out their gender identity. Um, and a key site of this work was happening on Tumblr, um, which is, that's, there's, that's no coincidence because that's also where there's a lot of fan fiction going a lot on, a lot of um, just fan culture. Um, and also on Tumblr, there's a lot of, um, there's a real social justice sensibility. And so Molly was first introduced to fan fiction, the whole idea of fan fiction um, on Tumblr. And by reading these stories that were reimagining existing um, stories that they were uh, familiar with in other contexts, like on TV, it all of a sudden gave them this cognitive frame of how to just 
make sense of what they were feeling and what they were experienced inside. So it, it gave them this framework to think about, but it also gave Molly a sense of validation and a sense of, oh, all of what I'm feeling is okay, because they were not feeling that everything they were feeling was okay, especially they were at an all girls um, school in Bermuda, which is where we grew up a tiny little island in the Atlantic Ocean. It's owned by the UK. It's very prim and proper British. Um, and in that context, Molly was feeling that what they were feeling inside was absolutely not okay and should not be discussed um, with the girls in their class. Um, so that was a total different feeling when they were on Tumblr. There, they felt like they were accepted, that they understood their identity, and it was a very self-directed experience. So Molly, again, Molly's story is unique, but its themes resonate. Um, and certainly the themes that came from talking with Molly are very much resonant. Um, and there in my second book, um, Writers in the S Secret Garden, which really focuses on the role of fan fiction in young people's writing and identity development. Um, now, unfortunately, self-direction isn't always easy for teens to experience online. Um, and my research and the research of others, probably some of you, um, shows that too often it is very difficult for teens to have a self-directed experience. Um, and a lot of that has to do with design. So design matters. That's a key theme in case you hadn't picked that up <laughs> in my book. Um, so let's just consider some specific concrete features that are common across social media platforms. So I do make the case in the book that like different platforms are very different and have different, um, different cultures. So if you just take Tumblr versus Instagram, very different experiences. However, there are certain features that you tend to find across social media platforms um, that really, I would argue, undermine um, the ability to experience self-direction. So if you take the feature in, of infinite scroll um, and then also combine with that the algorithmically curated feeds that you can infinitely scroll through, that particular combination, so being shown things that the algorithm thinks and often knows that are going to interest you, that's an extremely strong pull on a teen's attention. It's a strong pull on our attention, but particularly teens who are still developing their prefrontal cortex, and so their executive function skills may not be as good as ours. It's very hard to feel like you're in the driver's seat in that context. And then consider the likes and the comments and the tagging on posts um, that feed the algorithm and determine what gets prioritized. These metrics are also very visible and quantifiable. They're a very quantifiable way for teens to see who's popular, who's in and who's out, the kinds of responses they're getting from their peers. And that's really important during adolescence. Um, because figuring out who you are in relation to your peers, that's kind of the big developmental job. Um, and then, you know, you might want to ignore those, but you still get all these notifications on your phone of, about how many likes you're getting, how many comments, how many tags. And that really serves to underscore, well, this stuff must be really important. Um, and it's kind of unescapable. So all of these features shape what you can do on a social media platform. They shape what's seen on a social media platform and they shape what's valued um, on a social media platform. And importantly, what's done, what's seen and what's valued um, tends to be the kinds of behaviors that capture attention rather than support well-being. So it's really, again, very hard for a teen to experience self-direction in that context. So again, design matters here, but so do individual youth and their context. Now, there are clearly patterns to the challenges that teens experience on social media for all of the reasons I just mentioned, um, but they're not going to be experienced in exactly the same way for every teen. And that's because not all teens are the same and they don't all have the same context. So 
if you consider, let's say you have two teens and they are looking at the exact same content on TikTok, which is probably unlikely because of the algorithm that's so highly personalized. But let's just say they're looking at the exact same content um, and it's a lot of attractive people, a lot of fit people. They're following Thinspiration accounts, stuff like that. Um, and one of them has low body satisfaction and the other doesn't. They're going to have quite different experiences and quite different reactions to the images they come across on TikTok or Instagram or other social media platforms. Or you might have two teens who are very similar. Maybe they have similar vulnerabilities. They're not going to be exactly the same. Maybe they both have um, body um, uh, low body satisfaction. But they have very different surrounding contexts. So maybe one teen has at least one supportive adult or a friend in their life who can help them kind of reframe what they're seeing online and maybe kind of point out, you know what, all of this is very highly curated stuff. It takes a lot of effort uh, that goes into making such attractive images. Um, why don't you try unfollowing Thinspiration content and follow body positive content instead? So that surrounding context could really have a big impact on how a teen experiences social media. And that brings me into the second part of my framework, which is the role of community support. Um, so community support is absolutely important. It's not just the case that we're aiming for a self-directed digital experience, but we're also aiming for one that's community supported. And so these are really technology experiences that are supported by others, either during or surrounding a digital experience. Um, and I'll talk about what I, exactly I mean, starting with younger kids. So a lot of when you're talking about early childhood, a lot of this support tends to come from caregivers, um, unsurprisingly, whether that's parents or some other adult or um, in daycare teachers or such. Um, and there are a lot of different roles that caregivers can take on. One is gatekeeper. And so as the gatekeeper of Oliver's digital experiences, I can go on Common Sense Media and read all the reviews of these different apps, and I can decide what Oliver has access to and what he doesn't have access to. Um, I can decide if he has a tablet or not um, and how long he can use it for. I can monitor what he's doing. And um, this is actually more what I usually do. I kind of let him explore and choose what he wants to download. And then I watch to see what it's like. And then I kind of make my decision and then either let him keep going or switch to something else. Um, I can engage with him with, through joint media engagement. I can take on a more active role. Maybe he'll let me draw alongside him. Maybe he'll talk to me while and tell me and describe his picture as he's drawing. Or maybe I see that he's drawing something and I connect that to an experience that he's had or that we've had together. And then in that way, kind of expand the learning opportunity. Um, so I can take on all of these roles and all of these roles are me providing community support to Oliver's digital experience surrounding um, that particular experience. Now, when we move into older children and teens, the same roles apply. Um, so especially, you know, if you think of a, a child moving into the tween years, their parents are the gatekeepers of when they get to have a new phone or their first phone. Um, they can monitor, maybe they're monitoring with parental control um, software, you know, who the, the, their kids are talking to and things like that. Families who play video games together are, are engaged in joint media attention uh, engagement. Um, but then as kids, as kids um, cognitively develop, their lives, their internal lives become more complex. And so the roles that caregivers take on themselves become more complex. So for teens, parents might start asking about their experiences, which is really key to just sit and ask, 
you know, what's going well, what's difficult, um, and then listening, ideally, with empathy to what they have to say. Um, and maybe if they learn that their kids are having a difficult time, helping them to reframe some of their experiences and reactions. So, for instance, when I was talking earlier about a, a friend or an adult who is saying, you know what, those images are very highly curated. It's not the case that these people are just naturally perfect. Um, you know, helping to reframe what they're seeing online, maybe in a more private sphere, um, if a friend hasn't responded instantly to a text message, um, helping to reframe that and say, well, it might not be because they don't like you. It might be because they are having dinner or they have to do their homework or their phone has died. Um, so those kinds of helping kids to reframe are, can be really powerful and important. Um, sharing. So uh, a lot of some of my work um, a couple of years ago, we interviewed a group of parents and a group of teens about their phone experiences and their, in particular, their struggles with their phone experiences. And sometimes how they were talking about what they struggled with was indistinguishable. And so there's really opportunities here for parents to share what they're struggling with and so have that connection with their kids in that way. And then to develop strategies together. So maybe they're both struggling with checking their phone in the middle of the night. They can come up with a strategy of moving that phone into a different room um, and then kind of holding each other to that. Um, so I've been talking about these roles primarily from a caregiver perspective, but I do want to acknowledge that community support is not just caregivers. Um, so it is friends and teachers, siblings, extended family members, community members. Um, all of these people have an important role to play uh, in supporting young people's digital experiences. Now, sometimes, as and as I've mentioned, the examples I've given are more surrounding the digital experience, but sometimes the support comes actually from within the platform itself. So a perfect example of that is Molly's experience on Tumblr. Molly was able to find a community on Tumblr. And so in that sense, the community support wasn't surrounding their tech use, but actually embedded in it. Um, and then sometimes the actual platform itself can be a source of um, community support. So platforms have started experimenting with introducing time limits, like um, TikTok just introduced uh, just recently a 60 minute uh, a time limit for teens accounts. Um, there are take a break nudges if teens have been either on for a certain uh, a period of time or looking at particular content. Save YouTube disabled autoplay for teens um, and made all of the teens of accounts um, de private by default. So in that sense, it's actually the platform that's providing some level of community support. Um, and again, showing how very important design is because all of these are design decisions. Um, so this point does, again, reinforce how important design is, but it also reinforces that community support is more than parents and it's more than individuals. Um, and so it is the tech designers who are designing um, these platforms. It's the policy makers. So a lot of the changes that I showed on the previous slide about default privacy settings, um, take a break nudges, things like that, were a direct response to the UK's, UK's age appropriate design code, which, um, came into law a couple of years ago. And so in, in anticipation of that law, a bunch of companies started making changes to their platforms. So government policies, policies have a role to play. Um, researchers, we have a, an important role to play because I, I don't know about you, but I'm not always convinced that the policymakers know exactly what the best policies are to govern these um, tech designers. So our research, I think, is really important in showing like what is going to support well-being and what's not going to support well-being, what might be too draconian, um, what, what might start infringing on free speech and things like that. Um, but importantly, you know, these people down here and these roles down here um, show that the community support has to be on a level other than just 
individuals. Um, and that's really hard in our individualistic society where we have all these societal level problems um, and then we push it to the individuals to figure out. And it's the same thing with kids in tech and the challenges here. There's all sorts of supports. There's common sense media helping parents figure out what's good, what's bad. Um, teachers have a ton of work to do. Um, but what I'm really trying to emphasize in my book is that it shouldn't just be on this top level of individuals. Um, and then for I'm going to I circled these two roles because I'm going to come back to the roles that I play um, as a parent and researcher. And I want to end with these two roles and just say a word about how I'm coming at this and the kind of community support that I'm trying to provide in these two roles. Um, so, uh, and I also want to reflect how I'm using this two-step framework. Is it self-directed? Is it community supported to guide what I do as a researcher and also the concrete decisions that I have to make every day as a parent? Um, so as a researcher, my current work is focused on identifying what designs support or healthy development and what designs undermine healthy development, mostly focused on the teen years. Um, and trying to develop interaction designs that are more supportive of well-being rather than undermining and seeing if can we redesign social media is that really is it a possibility to make it a little bit more um, of a positive self-directed experience um, and then also how can we identify when things are going well versus not so well because if we can figure out like in cl as close to real time as possible when are things going well, when are they not, we'll have a good signal of what are the kinds of designs, what are the kinds of policies that we need to put in place to nudge things more towards um, the well-being side of things. And then as a parent, I really am honestly using this framework every day as a tool to guide the decisions that I make about Oliver's technology use. So as I ask in my mind, I say, is this particular experience self-directed? Is it community supported? I find that I'm able to put this framework um, to work for my specific situation and for my individual child. And then all of a sudden, what is very complex in my world as a researcher becomes a little bit more concrete. And then I have a better sense of when it's time to turn off Paw Patrol. <laughs> um, but although this, I have to say, this is taken in an airport and all bets are off when you're in an airport. So the sky is the limit. Oliver loves when we travel. <laughs> and then what about you? So what sorts of roles were you contemplating at the beginning of this talk? Um, and how might you um, use this two-step framework in your work as a researcher or a parent or whatever interactions you have with kids? Um, so I'll just leave you with that question and just say thank you so much.